The text of the referendum was just 16 words long. Should the United Kingdom remain a member of the European Union or leave the European Union? When a divided nation voted narrowly to leave, 650 members of Parliament were left to figure out how. After three and a half years of controversies, delays, resignations, extensions, and frustrations, Parliament finally ratified a withdrawal agreement in January 2020. But the ramifications of Brexit are far from fully settled. Now, Great Decisions asks where a fractured Britain can go from here. Britain after Brexit, next on Great Decisions. Great Decisions is produced by the Foreign Policy Association in association with Thomson Reuters. Funding for Great Decisions is provided by the Hereford Foundation, PricewaterhouseCoopers, LLP, and the Nelson B. Delavan Foundation. Even when it was all over, the years of contentious negotiations finally complete, the mood inside the European Parliament chamber was bitterly divided. As Eurosceptic representatives turned their backs, other lawmakers wiped back tears, held hands, and burst into song. The Brexit vote rocked an institution that seemed to be flying high. In 2012, the EU had won the Nobel Peace Prize for its role in bringing Europe together. Europe, which is the place where world wars began, has been conflict-free since the development of the European Union. So the idea of it as a peace project, you remember that for most countries in continental Europe, you know, they had experienced close to 100 years of war. But for the UK, peace was brought about by the UK as a sovereign nation. When it starts to develop the qualities of a state, of a nation state to some extent, or a, or a confederation at least, winning Nobel Peace Prizes for its foreign policy, these start to actually put question marks in many people's minds or Eurosceptic minds in the UK. Eurosceptic sentiment was spreading across the continent. Britain was only one of a dozen countries where prominent politicians were calling for the EU's demise. I mean, in the rest of the EU, Eurosceptic parties never talked about leaving the EU, now they are. An opinion poll of the Netherlands said that a majority there now want to leave. So we may well be close, perhaps, to Nexit. Uh, and similarly in Denmark, a majority there are in favour of leaving, so we could be quite close to Dexit. Uh, and I'm told the same may apply to Sweden and perhaps Austria and perhaps even Italy too. We were told that we were the first of many and soon there would be a Frexit from France and a Plexit from Poland and this was just the first of many. But I mean, to be honest, it's an unprecedented thing and those who have talked about their countries leaving, like Marine Le Pen in France um, or others, um, now don't really do so because it is seen as so difficult. In the course of the years since the Brexit vote has been a bit of a shock, I think, to the world in terms of the incompetence on display in so many institutions. That said, I think that Brexit has also served to alert the EU to the dangers of an EU which uh, does not take seriously the concerns of its member countries. In Britain, as in much of Europe, surveys show that young people are the most invested in the European project. All the polling evidence shows that the younger you are, the more likely you are to be pro-European. They argued that they had no say in this, whereas someone who was aged 100 in 2016, who may not be with us anymore, had more of a say over a profound decision that would affect their future to live and love and work and rest and play in uh, 27 other nation states. The young 
They are early young for a certain length of time. Because as they get older, they'll support the Conservative Party. What is happening here is that the young have slightly misunderstood what will happen after Brexit in terms of cultural links, and these will still continue. What we're seeing in a way is a demographic blip, a, an older population that turns out disproportionately to vote, that holds views that are disproportionately anti-migrant, racially conservative, anti-internationalism, and young people who know better. The generational divide raises the question of whether Britain might someday seek to return to the European fold. Because of the way our electoral system works, although 50% of people voted for Remain parties, the Leave side won and we've left now, so I think it's not going to be any time soon. Lots of people think there is a, a prospect of Britain going begging to go back into the European Union just as it did in the 70s and the 60s. But actually, I think it's incredibly difficult. And this is the challenge. Britain has yet to find a stable spot in the world after the Second World War. Britain itself is going to face enormous challenges just staying together. But similarly, the European Union will have to evolve. You know, what kind of EU will emerge? Will it be a multi-speed Europe, where some countries are much more tightly integrated and others are less so? All of these things, we will have to see how they play out. But I think it's entirely plausible that in a generation from now, Britain will ask to rejoin whatever the EU has evolved into. As soon as Britain first joined the European Economic Community back in 1973, activists set to work trying to reverse that decision. Euroscepticism as a movement uh, didn't really emerge until sort of the mid to late uh, 1980s, and it's often dated to a famous speech by Margaret Thatcher in Bruges, where she sort of articulated opposition to continued integration. My first guiding principle is this. Willing and active cooperation between independent sovereign states is the best way to build a successful European community. To try to suppress nationhood and concentrate power at the center of a European conglomerate would be highly damaging and would jeopardize the objectives we seek to achieve. It became clear that there would have to be movements towards a political union in order to deal with the problems of the monetary union. That made the British very uncomfortable because they could see that more and more powers were going to be moved to the European political union over time. Britain was never invaded in the Second World War. Why do you suddenly need to give up your sovereignty to join in with those countries that have been invaded or defeated? In the run-up to the 2016 referendum, campaigners clashed over divergent ideas about whether Britain's economy would benefit by leaving the EU. Now is the time, I think, for my country, our country, the UK, to seize the opportunities of leaving the EU. We may be extricating ourselves from the treaties of the European Union. We are not. We are not leaving Europe. The Leave campaign throughout promised that we could do better than being in the EU. I mean, our biggest trading partner is the European Union. Uh, that's 500 million people. And because we were in the EU, we had preferential deals with a whole load of countries. We were told that a minute to midnight in March uh, 2018, the original leaving date, there would be 40 trade deals in place. And I think when that actually happened, there were zero. They said that, for example, the NHS, which of course the National Health Service is beloved in Britain, always underfunded. And they said, well, we're going to take some of the money from Europe and that's going to substantially increase the funding for the NHS. Two months before the referendum, then President Barack Obama sparked a backlash when he weighed in on the impending decision. Maybe some point down the line, there might be a, a UK US trade agreement, but it's not going to happen anytime soon because our focus is in negotiating with a big bloc, the European Union, to get a trade agreement done. And UK is going to be in the back of the queue. 
it just confirmed both sides. Those who believe the UK should remain in the EU said exactly, just as Barack Obama said we should, makes absolute sense. And those who thought the UK should leave said exactly. If somebody like Barack Obama's in favor of it, it, you know, it must be a bad thing. Anytime that a country is uh, undertaking a decision that would be bad for the United States, we should make very clear uh, what our position is. I I'm sorry that Britain made the decision to leave the European Union. I think that's going to be very bad for Britain in the long run. Uh, I think it's going to be bad for Europe, and I think it's going to be bad for the United States. When the votes were tallied, the Leave campaign had pulled a shocking upset. But a glance at the electoral map reveals glaring geographic divisions. If it hadn't been 2016 in June, it's again unlikely that the referendum would have turned out the way it did. So what was causing that? Well, one was the migration crisis. In 2015, it peaked. Angela Merkel opened the doors in Germany to migrants who'd been flooding across from Afghanistan, from Syria, through two different routes into Europe. In addition, Europe itself was having a number of different policy problems. Remember, we had the economic recession of 2008. You had these regional splits, these city-urban splits, and these age splits. So what you saw was places that tended to be older and have fewer people who went to university, who had more blue-collar jobs, they tended to vote Brexit. And the cities voted overwhelmingly for Remain. Within hours of the announcement, David Cameron tendered his resignation as British Prime Minister. His replacement was a fellow Remainer, Theresa May, who now faced the impossible task of corralling a parliament whose members had wildly different visions of what a withdrawal agreement ought to entail. She became a fairly sort of hard Brexiteer. She tried to um, negotiate a deal with the EU over time that was uh, seen as sort of a hard Brexit. Um, there was a standoff between the EU and the UK over the issue of the border in Northern Ireland, which became a real sticking point. May eventually stepped aside after failing to rally enough MPs behind her deal. Instead, the prime minister who would lead Britain into a post-European future was the brash, controversial former mayor of London, Boris Johnson. He took the reins in 2019 on a campaign full of promises to tear up Theresa May's deal. It was a whirlwind, but he did most of the things that he promised. He got the deal, and then before Parliament voted it through, he called a general election and he won a huge majority on a campaign promising to get Brexit done. So in those two seismic events, the future direction of Britain changed dramatically, and the man at the heart of both campaigns was Boris Johnson. In Northern Ireland, home to the United Kingdom's only land border, the mechanics of Brexit have reopened old wounds. The Good Friday Agreement of 1998, which ended 30 years of bloody conflict known as the Troubles, mandated an open border with Ireland. We have to reconcile our commitments and obligations under the Good Friday Agreement, um, which is the basis for peace uh, in Ireland and the development of the All-Ireland Economy, for example, uh, and also our obligations and responsibilities as a member of the European Union to protect the single market, protect the customs union. Certainly for uh, anyone uh, in the Irish diaspora, and of course that includes quite a lot of people in the United States, uh, they really do not want to see the UK renege on an agreement that may, uh, because of the knock-on effects, end up creating some kind of hard border on the island of Ireland between Northern Ireland, part of the UK, and the Republic of Ireland in the south. To undermine the Good Friday Agreement is for the UK not just to undermine international law, it's to undermine its relationship with the Republic of Ireland, with the rest of the world, but also to undermine its own national laws. In Ireland, where the EU remains popular, 
some politicians and activists hope Brexit can rekindle the movement for a united Ireland. I think Brexit has changed things massively, as you know. And I think the conversation now about constitutional change, reunification, has broadened to the extent that it's not simply a Sinn Féin matter. This is now really a national question and a matter of national interest. As in Northern Ireland, residents of Scotland voted overwhelmingly to remain. In Parliament, the Scottish National Party has been among the EU's most ardent champions. It would be difficult anyway to sort of get the kind of agreement that will allow uh, another referendum to um, go ahead. But certainly for a lot of people in Scotland, the polls will tell us they are quite ready for independence. But Northern Ireland and Scotland were not the only places to vote remain. By a margin of more than 700,000 votes, Londoners cast their lot with the EU. There's no doubt that the spirit of London is very much against the spirit of Brexit, uh, which can be seen in the votes in London, which were very much anti-Brexit. A majority of the population of London is made up of ethnic minorities. Many immigrants, I think then probably very little attracted by a campaign based on the idea of national sovereignty and national tradition. And also, I, I'm quite sure that many of them felt that the Brexit campaign was an anti-immigrant, sort of xenophobic campaign. Now, it remains to be seen whether London can retain its position as Europe's financial hub in the post-Brexit world. The City of London, the great financial institution, the, 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 the British equivalent of Wall Street, was said to be in danger from Brexit because it was said that many banks and businesses would, would move away from London to the European continent because they wouldn't be able to do business in the EU. And none of that has happened. However much Brexiteers tend to talk about this new swashbuckling global Britain, uh, inevitably means uh, uh, the making of walls and the dismantling of proximity. And as Britain walls itself off from the rest of the world, London suffers. I don't think they will replace London, but uh, what you see is, of course, that certain functions are moving from London to Amsterdam or to Paris or to Frankfurt. It's not that banks are leaving completely or that London will be finished as a financial hub. During the referendum campaign, the two sides sparred over the prospect of a bilateral free trade agreement between Britain and the United States. Negotiations for such a deal got underway in May 2020. They're going to have trouble with the European Union and exporting to the European Union if they change some of their standards to accommodate the US. And there are many standards, automobiles, electrical standards, even pallet size standards. From the US point of view, farmers and manufacturers are quite keen to sell into the UK because it's a large market, a large consumer market. In fact, it's about a quarter of the whole EU market and is definitely something they would like to sell into. So I think there's a lot of mutual interest in a UK U.S. trade agreement, yes. I don't think the United States should negotiate a bilateral deal with the United Kingdom before we've negotiated a deal with Europe. That's a very clear way to express to the world that we prioritize a strong European Union. The United Kingdom is not as protectionist as the European Union. Our trade negotiations with the European Union don't include agriculture. That's been, you know, that's been the big breakdown. But the United Kingdom is open to accepting U.S. protein supplies, if you will. Sort of the, you know, the art of the deal, if you will, when you can't make a deal with everybody, make a deal with somebody, and who knows where it might lead. Pro-Brexit politicians argued that leaving the EU could reinvigorate Britain's so-called special relationship with the United States. Opponents of Brexit charge that Britons must come to terms with their nation's diminished status. When the US president meets with 
the European Commission president and the president of the council and the president of the presidency, the UK won't be there. So that's on the negative side of the ledger. Um, on the other side of the ledger, we have to say Britain's role as an intelligence partner with the US I think will remain paramount, uh, not least because of the technical capacities the UK has in the cyber and encryption and surveillance and intelligence side. So not just the sort of MI6, MI5, but GCHQ side and the kind of five eyes, which of course, again, is entirely beyond Europe. But the Republican view is now very different. It's, it's different from that traditional US foreign policy position. It is pro-Brexit, defiantly pro-Brexit. You are seeing signs of Britain becoming a country to argue over among the two parties in the US. And that is a very difficult position for the UK to be in because it has to start to manage those relationships and to try to push its interests as the parties in control change in Congress or in the White House. Whether it's nationalism or globalism, some of these things are somewhat cyclical in their trends, but Right now, at this moment, we have this grand opportunity where there's a reflection in two countries of a similar goal, and I think that Brexit presents that opportunity for us. At the heart of the Brexit debate is the question of how Britons view their own country. Proponents of Brexit have tapped an undercurrent of nostalgia for the glory days of the British Empire. A lot of it was this previous mentality of the glories of empire. And we were told they need us more than we need them. And this whole idea of rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves. Britons never, never, never will be slaves. So I think a lot of that kind of imagery and even stuff about the war and spitfires and the mentality of, you know, we can do this. Two world wars and one world cup, I think they often say. England has a deep common history, shared history with continental Europe. The Brexiters have wanted to invent a history in which it's uh, always, and especially at the moments of uh, greatest glory, standing aside from continental Europe. I think it was a nostalgic um, vote. Um, I think it was also sort of out of keeping with the world as it was becoming, because of course, the world was not sort of going back to the 50s or 60s. It's a world increasingly dominated by large powers like the United States, China, India, and others. And Britain's role in that, I think, is quite problematic if it's sort of acting on its own outside of any bloc. Advocates of Brexit have promised that it is still possible for Britain to be a leader on the world stage. Britain has wanted to sort of try to raise its, its vision to a global world beyond Europe that has more growth opportunities. The emerging market of China and Vietnam and Latin America and the Gulf and raise your sights from Europe, go to the world. We can become more successful economically if we, as a former British member of the European Parliament, who is a Eurosceptic, phrased it, we need to unshackle ourselves from the European corpse whether Britain can remain a leader on the world stage is, I think, still within Britain's grasp. It's up to Britain and it depends how it handles itself as it leaves the European Union. This is a country that will still have a seat on the UN Security Council and be the second biggest investor in, in defence capabilities in NATO, be a, a reasonable voice in the WTO and IMF, and is still a large economy, a top 10 world economy. But it's not the old Britain. It's not a global superpower. I think the best way for them to do it is to try to uh, be sort of the leader engine of cooperation between democracies globally. So to transcend those regional groups and to promote democratic cooperation between democracies in East Asia, in Europe, in North America, on these common sort of challenges, and particularly in light of a rising sort of authoritarian bloc. There is some indication that that is where they're headed. As Prime Minister, Theresa May was fond of proclaiming that Brexit means Brexit. But implementing the result of the referendum was never that simple. 
The contentious negotiations over the withdrawal agreement were only the first step. The hard work of delivering on the myriad promises made to the British people, economically, politically, and spiritually, will be even more difficult. Great Decisions is America's largest discussion program on global affairs. Discussion groups meet online via Zoom and Google Meets, in person at community centers, libraries, places of worship, and homes across the country to discuss global issues with their community. Participants read the eight-topic briefing book, meet to discuss each topic, and complete a ballot which shares their views with Congress. To start or join a discussion group in your community, visit fpa.org or call 1-800-477-5836. Great Decisions is produced by the Foreign Policy Association in association with Thomson Reuters. Funding for Great Decisions is provided by the Herford Foundation, PricewaterhouseCoopers, LLP, and the Nelson B. Delavan Foundation.